Thomas Geraldo. I'm the executive director here at MDPL, and we're very excited to have you all here for our last lecture of the calendar year, ending with a great uh, climax with uh, Professor Donnelly. And I also want to ask, do we have board members in attendance? Can you raise your hand? Great, so we have Jack. Um, Jack Johnson, our chair, our new chair of the board. Joel Levine, vice chair. Uh, Jack Binglass, secretary. And I know we have former chairs and future chairs and board members. <laughs> 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 So um, our next major program is Art Deco Weekend, which we're all working around the clock to get prepared. Joel Levine is our new chair of the Art Deco Weekend Festival. He's in the yellow shirt. If anybody wants to volunteer, talk to him. Um, and so without further ado, um, I'm going to, oh, well, last thing, I want to ask, are there any tour guides in the audience? Please raise your hand. Let's give them all a round of applause our mission going every day of the year. So um, Jeff Donnelly is a public historian of the Miami Design Preservation League. He holds a research doctorate from New York University in American Studies with an emphasis on urban history, literature, and politics. He served as an educator at Fordham and New York Universities, as well as a lecturer in the American Studies program at the University of Miami a history teacher and department chair at Miami Country Day School, and a master teacher in the Woodrow Wilson Foundation, TORCH, which is Teachers Teaching Teachers Training Program. He continues to contribute to MDPL and the MIMO Tour Guide Academy, which he founded in 1990. He uses the city as a school methodology in his classes, as well as the MDPL Tour Program, and he's a co-author of Miami Architecture, an AIA Guide to Downtown, the Beaches, and Coconut Grove, published in 2010, and he's a frequent reviewer for History Miami, H Florida, and other publications. So let's all welcome Jeff Donald. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Daniel. And can everybody hear me in the back, George? Yes. Thank you. Yes. All right, good. If it falls off, please just wave, George, or something. <laughs> thank you. Uh, welcome. Uh, I just have a question. Uh, how many people have ever taken the Miami Design Preservation League walking tour? Okay. You will hear some of the same things that you heard on the tour. However, uh, I hope, and my purpose tonight, is to have you think about those things that you already know in a new way. In other words, uh, we have the basis for things, but we'll also, I'll also do enough to catch up the people who haven't done the tour. And of course, you should do that right away, tomorrow, uh, at 10.30. But in any event, uh, welcome. And this is about the uh, origins of Miami Beach Tropical Art Deco. And this is one of the earlier buildings, the colony, which is right down the street uh, between 7th and 8th. It's done in 1935. This is stencil typeface, a modern typeface. Uh, this was, at one time, at least in 1935, a fairly modern vehicle. <laughs> it would be a wonderful antique to possess today. I don't know if anybody has one. But in any event, uh, so this, this is something that really involves the concept of being modern, as we'll see. There's a phrase here, interwar modern design. Now, I really would suggest to you that if the district in which we are now sitting and standing were to be called the interwar modern design district rather than the art deco district, it would be a loss. But a lot of the world would call the architecture or much of the architecture that we have here interwar modern design. But we call it art deco. And why we do that is certainly part of the story here. Another important part of the story here is that the questions 
that I'm going to try to answer as we go along are questions that really came from tourists. People who were on the tour that I was leading and they would ask a question uh, that I couldn't answer. Uh, that's how you learn. I learned from being a teacher for some almost 50 years. In any event, uh, that's where these questions come from, as we, again, as we'll see as we go forward. Well, this of course is the Chrysler Building in, in New York City. It would be generally referred to as an Art Deco building. The, if you take a look at it and compare and contrast it to this building, the Tides Hotel, which again is right down the street here on Ocean Drive, there are some things that are similar and some things that are quite different. It's a skyscraper, as is this, it's of course a little shorter than the Chrysler Building, which when it was opened was the tallest building in the world. But however, for Miami Beach, this is a relatively tall structure at that time, in 1936, when it was built. It also has, surrounding the doorway, a building material that's not found here in the Chrysler Building. And this is what's called Keystone, quarried in the Florida Keys, particularly in Key Largo, and brought here and put around the doorway and above the doorway here. So there's a building material that's here, but not found in New York. There's also a linkage to seafaring, the porthole windows. To my knowledge, there are no porthole windows in the Chrysler Building. There are, of course, in 1 Fifth Avenue, which is a little bit downtown from the Chrysler Building. But New York is also on the water and has a lot of shipping going in and out. But in any event, there are things, ways these buildings are similar, and ways in which they are different. We talk about the differences and what makes this building a tropical Art Deco building. This is Miami Beach. Uh, this is from uh, the Florida Memory Site. Uh, this is, we believe, this is Miami Beach in approximately 1929. And the reason for that is, here is the Blackstone, which was uh, completed in, in 1929. And then here is old Miami Beach City Hall. So uh, this is 8th Street, 9th, 10th, and there's us right out here. Whoops, we haven't been built yet. So it's right there. So that kind of gives you the, thing. What, the kind of things that to notice here. In 1927, this is Ocean Drive, and there isn't a whole lot on Ocean Drive in 1927. This is another view from the, an airplane, of course, out over the water. And this is this old city hall. So we've kind of turned the picture around. This is, of course, between 11th and 12th Street. This is Lincoln Road. And you can tell because this is Carl Fisher's real estate sales building, which is still there at the corner of Jefferson and, and Lincoln Road. But here, in 1927, this area at the northern end of Ocean Drive here. So here, this is you know Collins and this is Washington. There's really not very much at all. The world that was, though, included buildings like the Blackstone that I just pointed out a moment ago, and the Nautilus Hotel, which was a little bit north of 41st Street in Miami Beach. Miami Beach Resort architecture in 1930. An example of it is the Casa Arena down the street. This is an interior view of it. And we might ask, where did LaPointe, the architect of record, and Alden Freeman, probably the really the thought person behind the architecture, where did they get the idea for this kind of a building? Fortunately for us, they told us. <laughs> and they said they got the idea from this, which was constructed in 1510, 1512, by the son of Christopher Columbus. Yeah. Now, I chose this interior view because it has these arches. The exterior view of this doesn't look like very much like this at all, but they got the idea 
for this style of architecture is what basically what they said. This is the last building that we'll talk about tonight that we kind of really know where the architect got the idea. There's at least one person in the audience who lives in this building. Wave, please. Yes. Higher, people can't see you. There you go, okay. Miami Beach Resort architecture in the same year. Now, this to me does not look like resort architecture. This could be in Brooklyn. It's a very simple, straightforward building. It has some decorative elements up on the top, and so forth. But something has to happen to this type of design between 1930 and the end of the 30s to make for a resort tropical art deco architecture. So we have a couple of questions. I wonder where they got those design ideas. Where did the people that we call the Art Deco architects, where did they get their ideas? I wonder who brought these ideas and when. And I wonder how and why those ideas got here, as opposed to someplace else, as we know many of them did. So where did these, this is a man by the name of Prius, doing the building we just saw a moment ago. And this, of course, many people will recognize as being the Bass Museum. This was done by Russell Pencoast, also in 1930. Question, where did they get the ideas? They haven't told us, so we have to search. And our search is going to come up with probabilities rather than the answer Alden Freeman told us where he got the idea. Many people, including many tour guides, will say they got the idea from the International Exposition of Decorative Arts and Industrial Modern Design held in Paris in 1925. And over here, when the lights go back on, you're going to be seeing other versions, excuse me, don't want to get anybody, okay, of this, of this poster. Now, what we are pretty sure about is that the term Art Deco that we use today came from that exposition. And it's pretty clear that in French, Art decorative, if you just shorten that up a little bit and remove, remove the accent, as Corbusier did, he called it Art Deco in French. And then a man by the name of Bevis Hillier is going to write about that exposition and use that term in English for the first time in 1968. Now, the question that arises is, the building, are the buildings that we have, you know, directly derived from the designs of this exposition. Well, let's take a look. These are, you know, exposition structures. These are temporary structures. All of them are going to be demolished at the end of the exposition. But we see some things right away. Symmetricality, draw a line down the middle. It's the same on both sides. You have a combination of curves and rectilinear structures. You have this stacking kind of in a ziggurat shape. You have very highly decorated buildings. This is really a couple of boxes on top of one another, but on the exterior of the building, a great deal of decorative development. This is the Roman organization building, and it's a little bit different than the other ones because of the decorative elements are minimal. And it has a curvature that some have, but most don't although it still has that kind of stacking. This is the Belgian <coughs> exhibit at the, uh, at the exposition, and it's truly, you know, too much ain't enough. <laughs> the decorative elements here. Okay. Even, perhaps even more true of this kind. One of the things about the top of these pylons at the entryway is that at the top is a design which is called the frozen fountain. And that's here. And of course we have one of those right across the street at the Congress Hotel on Ocean Drive. Now, take a look here. And this of course 
is over here on, on 12th Street. And what do these buildings have in common? And in what ways are they different? This building is clearly more elaborate. Now remember, of course, this is also a temporary building. However, the basic design is the same. You have a dominant central design element. You have two design elements on either side that are different from the central element, but complementary to it. And the same thing is true here at the Marlin, that you have this dominant central design element, freeze work, and then on either side. Also, you have no eyebrows here. We have them here, and we're going to see them over and over again in the tropical Art Deco buildings here on Miami Beach. Why? Because there's sun here. And in the wintertime, the sun can come in. Whereas in the summertime, the sun is much higher and is less likely to come in the windows. So they're decorative, yeah, but they're also functional. So, my argument is that Art Deco, as developed out of that exhibition, is really a style and a design today with a reach far behind, arch behind architecture and even in the earliest days. It's an international style. It's one of the first. Some people would argue it is the first, and I would agree with them, that it really is the first international style that spreads around the world along with European colonial and imperial ambitions. It is a phase, and some of you may not be able to see this phrase, a phase of the modern movement. So the argument that I'm going to make is that what we call Art Deco, in tropical Art Deco here on Miami Beach, is but one phase of a much larger and longer movement, which essentially we call the modern movement, or modernism. Modernism is a movement that develops in the period from 1870 to 1920, largely as a response to the industrialization that occurs in Europe and the United States at the same time. And there are different characteristics. It's removed from an idealized representation and expression to expression and abstraction, from revivalism and historicism to authenticity. We change from an organic aesthetic to expression on the machine age, new technologies, traditional crafts and forms, and exploiting the primitive or naive art for modern expression. So those are the characteristics of this cultural trend. Do we have a devotee of the goddess Venus in the room? <laughs> Nobody's admitting to that. <laughs> However, do we agree that the goddess Venus is probably made up by somebody? That there isn't such a person? And yet this artist is presenting the goddess Venus as a person. This is not real, is it? It's inauthentic. However, I will lose this argument, I think, but I would argue that this is a more authentic piece of art. Not because you know a woman's body better, having seen this, but because you know more about the mind of Picasso who did it. Because it's an expression of what he thinks and feels about that human form. Many of you will recognize the Woolworth Building. I, when a recent visit to New York, I tried to find out, they turned it into a condominium. Um, and I tried to find out if I could afford one of the units there, and the answer to that was no. <laughs> However, this was, this was built before, before World War II, excuse me, before World War I, and was, when it was built, the tallest building in the world. Now, I've always had the imagination that the Woolworth Company had a very large rake, and they started near San Francisco, and they moved east, just scraping up nickels and dimes as they went, and they piled all those nickels and dimes together here in New York and built this building. Which means that, of course, this building is pretending to be a cathedral, but it's actually a pile of money. 
it's not really an authentic architecture. It's not an architecture that tells us what you really are doing here. It's masking what was happening. Now, once you've thought about that big rake, you'll never think about this building in the same way. <laughs> this, of course, is the Empire State Building, done in 1931, and immediately became the tallest building in the world, knocking off the Chrysler Building that we saw earlier. And, of course, this building is telling you what we are. We're the tallest building in the world. And we don't need any decorative elements at all, except us, the building itself, and its engineering that it's tall and that it also, they thought, was going to enable Zeppelins to link up to a mooring mast at the top of the Empire State Building. And then people were going to climb down a ladder <laughs> to this level here, which is represented by this photograph. That was one modern step too far uh, for the people. This never happened and a, no Zeppelin ever actually moored at the, at the Empire State Building. That's a digression, but... Uh, from kind of a organic aesthetic to a machine age aesthetic. William Morris, his home, that called the Red House in 1859. He, was, he thought of himself as a modernist, but he wanted to keep the organic features of craftsmanship. And so you have materials that really do appear not too far from the earth on which the building stands. Here is the home of Le Corbusier. That's his studio at the end. And so you're moving from an organic aesthetic to this looks like a factory, except for the studio at the end, which is where the work was really done. We're back here at the Casa Casarina, which from the outside particularly looks as though it's made up of organic materials. The stucco is rusticated. The, the, the uh, keystone is rough and just carved out of the earth. It's not a symmetrical building, etc. Whereas 1390 Ocean Drive is. Now, the question is, does this really look like an industrial building? And I would argue, yeah. It certainly doesn't look like a resort architecture building. <coughs> the Parthenon and Lincoln Center. So using, as I argued, you know, traditional uh, forms, but using contemporary technology to construct them. And then using what they call primitive in the 1930s and 20s, 20s and 30s, primitive art and primitive design, and using that as a model for what they call contemporary or modern design. So, where does this cultural turn come from? And this is the part that will get controversial. A lot of people don't agree with what I'm about to say, but I'll say it and you can make up your mind whether you agree with me or not. But in any event, the first group of people and the leader of that group, Otto Wagner, the Austrian Secession, and the Wiener Werkstatt, were these were organizations in Vienna at the turn of the 20th century, going into the 20th century, beginning earlier, in which they were going to secede. Now, they were not going to secede politically, but they were going to secede intellectually and culturally from the demands of the academy and the, all of the panoply of the Habsburg Empire. You have Bauhaus, Berlach, who was a Dutch architect and what's called the Amsterdam School, Art Nouveau and Italian Futurism, which again is down the bottom, some of you may not see it, but in any event it's something that we'll try to deal with a little bit. Otto Wagner, and what he, what he his, his basic idea is that we want the art that we do to actually express this cultural transition that the machine age is bringing to us. And one of the main characteristics of the machine age is, of course, engineering. And he says he wants his art to be in his engineering. 
And this is an example of what he meant. This is the Postal Savings Bank in Vienna, done in 1906. The engineering of this is that this is an all-glass floor. This is an all-glass roof to the building. And this was all done in 1906. It's a truly beautiful space to be in. A postal savings bank is a way of using the postal service to allow ordinary people to put money away and save. And yet, this is a piece of fine art, as well as an engineering phenomenon. Here we have our version of it here at the post office. This is the cleanest I've ever seen that space. <laughs> but one thing about it is, you know, instead of, have, instead of having a kind of low ceiling, dull place to go in and pick up your letters, faux gilded, but kind of looking golden, like Trump Tower sort of, and where all your mailboxes were, and a piece of art as well. This is a space that has additional expense for I to celebrate that this is a public space. There is no principal patron of this, except maybe for Eleanor Roosevelt, because this was all built by the Treasury Department under the New Deal. And the artist, man by Daniel Hardman, was also hired by the fine arts section of the Treasury Department. When they seceded, they needed a place to go, and they built this which is still there. The Viennese refer to this building as the Onion because of this up there. Okay. Kind of Art Nouveau looking in a way. But their motto for each time is its art. For the art is its freedom. Now Emperor Franz Joseph would not approve of that statement. And that of course was the idea. They were rebelling in the Austrian sort of way, not actually you know, <coughs> killing people, but rebelling and, and seceding from the dominance, the cultural dominance of the Austro-Hungarian Empire at the time. And the leader of the secessionist movement, after Otto Wagner kind of said, you guys do it, because that was Clint. And the workshop, the workshop produced designs by like all of these. Now this is the claim of a student of Otto Wagner that the Austrian secession movement was the beginning of modernism in Europe. This is the controversy. Other people will say, no, 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 there are other things that come first, etc. But it's hard to argue that People are doing this in the late in the 1890s when other people are not doing anything like this at all. They're certainly not doing anything like this in the United States. So what it is, the first thing is the idea of the total work of art. And to protest the younger generation against the traditional art of their forebears, a separation from the past towards the future. So they were seceding from stagnation as they saw it, from tradition, there is seceding to enable the future to come alive. <clears throat> Starting the first, the most exclusive, the most concrete, and the first ideologically organized system. That's the claim. I agree. Meanwhile, another German uh, group, speaking group of people, later in the 1920s formed the Bauhaus and led here by uh, Walter Gropius and again the ultimate is to create a total work of art but they are also interested in being part of and in expressing this cultural turn that I've talked about they're kind of at the end of it by 19, they're in the 1920s. And this is Dessau. This is their school building. All of this has been restored. It was really let go pretty badly during the uh, uh, DDR or the uh, Eastern, Eastern Germany. Uh, uh, and then this is a Meisterhaus. I should live here. <laughs> 
These still exist, and uh, the people who live here now are students uh, at, at the. Uh, and this is Miami Beach in 1937. So take a look. Now, it's hard to find this from 1937 at that international exposition of decorative arts in 1925. This is another sensibility developed from it, an expression of it, but quite different. Being, you know, very left people, the, uh, the Bauhaus created a housing estate. I had the opportunity, together with Nancy, to go there, and it was done by Gropius. It was done in 1926-28. And this is what it looked like. Uh, these are actually townhouses, for the most part. So they're entryways. You can see the entryways are pretty regular. And so these are townhouses. What has happened here is that people, after the fall of the DDR in 1989 and following, the people expressed their freedom. So they went back to the secession and said, to each time it's art and to each art it's freedom. So they kind of redid some of Walter Gropius' work. So it's hard to find an original structure from uh, the Torton Estate uh, today. But uh, there are some, and they've, and they've managed to, uh, they preserve some, and you can go and, go and visit them. Now, I would suggest to you that this does not look as much, there are some things that it has in common with the Flamingo Park neighborhood nearby us here, a little bit to our, to our west. But it's not the same. It, it, it's, a, it's a kind of a different, different look, and even a, a, a different form. However, it looks a lot like the Green Hills project in Green Hills, Ohio, which was one of the green belt cities built by the New Deal. They had originally planned more than a dozen of these. They built three. Um, and one of the reasons was the resettlement administration, which ran it, and then the Works Progress administration, which provided the workers here. All right, they, the resettlement administration was declared unconstitutional by the United States Supreme Court, and the whole program fell apart. But in any event, here they are, and that does look a lot like yeah. uh, this. These are Bauhaus artists. And this, of course, is, again, right up the street. This is the McAlpin. And I think somebody took a look at Bauhaus art before they did this. This is Berlach. It's hard to say in Dutch. It's the most unpronounceable language I've ever encountered. But in any event, this is his not so looking so modern building, except for its symmetricality and so on. And then this is interior art. However, his students go on to do very interesting things. And this is one of them. And they, this is public housing, yeah, just kind of in a suburb of Amsterdam. And then they have this tower here. And then we have the Plymouth, which is not public housing anymore, although New World Symphony used to live there. Now, another fashion or style, Art Nouveau. This is a poster here for Sarah Bernhardt. It looks a lot like a Gustav Klimt painting in some ways. And this, of course, is the very familiar Metro sign. These are Art Nouveau doors from actually pretty far around the world, actually, mostly in Europe, but elsewhere as well. And then these are Miami Beach doors. Uh, the source here, for anybody interested, this is the Historic American Building Survey, which you can get through the Library of Congress. But, if you notice two things about them, one, they are in black and white, which is something we have to resolve in a moment, but take a look. Very similar in some ways to the Art Nouveau structure, very much more simplified, but the kind of natural shape, a natural shape like a flower or like a branch going up or something of that sort, but formalized and modernized. Whereas this doorway really looks more like something out of the Bauhaus rather than something influenced by Art Nouveau. And have 
color, thanks to Bill Wisser. And you should immediately put in a pre-order, right? Can we? Uh, not quite yet. Not quite yet, okay. So <laughs> you can put in a pre-order for Doorways in Paradise. This, of course, was a presentation in this room in May. Right, in May. So uh, this one, if you look here, it's more representational in many ways than Art Nouveau, but there's still a formalization of the natural elements, both the, both the bird. You don't actually get a bird standing still like that. And there's you know, kind of a shaping to it. This is more rectilinear here. And you know, again, there's a different a contrast between what I would say is Art Nouveau influence and something that is something more like Bauhaus. Okay, Italian futurism. Another strain, another ethnic, you know, version of this evolution in modernism. I had the opportunity to actually see this painting in the uh, Guggenheim a couple of years ago. It was hung up there. It was wonderful in, in real life. And then Santalia's version of a city, which in fact never was realized. And this is another unrealized version from him. But notice what he says. There's no architecture has existed since 1700. What does that mean? It means that everything between 1700 okay. and the mid-20s mid okay, is phony, fake, an imitation, inauthentic, not real. But we're going to fix it. And I'll just read you this what he, at the end here, what he says, and in that idiotic flowering of stupidity and impotence that took the name of neoclassicism. Wow. Okay. Now, there was a problem with him saying this at the time that he said it, because the leader of the country liked neoclassicism. And this is a photograph uh, taken, actually two. This is, this is the statue, this is one of these statues here. Actually, one out here, it's out here, behind the tree. Okay. And you know, this is a Roman lictor, you know, kind of set off. It's a, you know, a clear imitation, but a modern imitation and of the classical forms. And needless to say that Mussolini love this building. You can go visit this area. They've been working on it, and uh, it's wonderful. Uh, lots of 1930s uh, buildings. The whole thing was done as a preparation for an International World's, World's Fair that was going to be held in 1942. Uh, it didn't happen, uh, but many of the buildings stayed, and they were able to renovate them and so on. And they're all public buildings, so you can kind of go in and out. They, they hold, uh, they have their museums there, here, and so on and so forth. It's a little bit south of, south of Rome, of Rome, not very clear. But Italian futurism escapes to Asmara. And we had an exhibit here uh, featuring this structure. Uh, this is the a Fiat building, and uh, Tagliero is the owner of the building. Uh, this is a service station in Asmara. Uh, the interesting thing is that these projections, cantilevers, are 18 meters wide, each of them. The actual architect was actually an engineer, and so of course he's living Otto Wagner's dream, right? Creating art out of his engineering. And he was committed to this structure, so committed that there are two stories involved. His name was Giuseppe Pitazzi. And one story goes that at the declared opening of the building, he stood on the top of it, of one of those wings out on the end, and said, if this collapses, I will shoot myself. And took out a gun and held it to his head. <laughs> That's story number one. Story number two is that the builder did not want to take the wooden supports that were all here out. He had built it and he said, I am not so sure about pulling the wooden supports. And the second story is that Patazzi pointed the gun at him and said, take him out. 
However, we have something similar here at Miami Beach. So next time you see Russell Galvin and you know admire his Italian futurism. Uh, <laughs> however, none of what I've said helps to answer these two questions, which came from the tourists, from the people who come here on our tours. And question number one. How did this building boom that you're talking about, and they look around and they see all of these buildings that they've seen, how did this happen in the Great Depression? How did that happen? Where did the money come from? Where did the entrepreneurial courage come from? How did it happen? And then secondly, it's not a given that the design they're going to use is modern, or what they called modern at the time because there had been a very successful design here at Miami Beach, which we call today Mediterranean Revival, and they call lots of different things, Spanish Revival and so forth. Carl Fisher said, rich people like this, I want rich people, so we will do this. And it had been very successful. Why not continue? And nothing that I've said so far explains that. What I've said so far it talks about interwar modernism everywhere, including Miami Beach. But how come it happened here? Miami Beach Tropical Art Deco. I wonder who brought it, and what did they bring, and when? Well, we should look at the architects, shouldn't we? And these are five of the leading architects. Henry Hohauser and his firm, in his office, did more of these modern or art deco buildings than anybody else. And L. Murray Dixon was kind of second and Roy France and Albert Annis are in that, and Anton Skislowitz is really the fifth. There are other people involved, obviously, but these are the five leading folks. Henry Hohauser. Today, the Park Central. He was educated at Pratt Institute in Brooklyn, and he came to Miami in 1932 and practice architecture for over 20 years. Now, the question arises, there are lots of places that a young architect could go, but he came to Miami Beach in 1932. So what did he know? What was going on? What brought him here? Dixon is the only one who was born in Florida, went to Georgia Tech. Beginning in 1933, he begins to design here at Miami Beach. This is his Raleigh Hotel, Ken up, this, uh, now up Collins Avenue from here. Roy France, from Chicago, actually he was from Minnesota originally, but he studied at the Army Institute of Technology in Chicago, which eventually becomes part of the Illinois Institute of Technology in Chicago when Mies van der Rohe takes it over uh, as, as he flees from, uh, from Europe, flees from Germany. And his philosophy, and this is interesting, and again, I realize some of you may have a little trouble seeing this here, that you have his, his philosophy of design was to let in the air and the sun, and that's what people come to Florida for. Now think back to 1390, okay, which doesn't really do that. We're looking at something, is Daniel around? Yeah. Yeah, I don't know what we have here, Daniel, but it seems to be okay. Let me just see, work it and see. But near, be nearby. Oh, thank you. <laughs> this is uh, Roy France and his Winter Haven building. Uh, he also studied at the Army Institute of Technology in Chicago. He was certified to practice architecture there in 1921, and he was recertified to practice architecture here in Florida in 1935. So they're early on in this development of this boom. The last one, Anton Skislowitz, and this is not in the Art Deco District, but this is the Ocean Surf, which is part of the district along Ocean Terrace and is about to be renovated. So throughout 1940, Miami Beach continues to boom with 200, and this is one year, 279 new hotels, 890 apartment buildings, and 
3,338 new houses, one year. Hmm. This is kind of the culmination of that plan. Hmm. And it cries for an explanation, I think. And again, remember when this is. <coughs> These are you know, hotel projects, and that's the list. And take a good look that <coughs> it starts taking off here, kind of is slow, and then in 33, begins a bump, and another 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 bump. Now these bumps are bigger, but these, they continue to go up, and that's going to be significant when you consider the years 1937 and 1938. What Howard Kleinberg argues is that Miami Beach was different than the rest of the United States, that the rich people who were here, they became maybe less rich, but they did not lose their lifestyle here on Miami Beach. That's his argument, and I agree with that, but it doesn't affect the district in which we are and that is immediately to our west. This is Earl Upon, some of you are familiar with him, and he's the artist who did the mural in the Essex House and in the Victor. He came here in uh, 1988 during Art Deco weekend and restored the mural at the Essex House. And while he was doing that, uh, Keith Root had a chance to interview him. And he said, what was it like to be an artist, to be a craftsman here? And what he said was, we worked hard all day and we played hard all night. So it was an exciting time for a young artist and for a young architect. This was a place where the action was happening. And after it starts, it becomes more, you know, more likely that people are going to come and try to participate in it. But how they got here in 1932, 33, 35 is still a little bit of a mystery, I think. Now, what happened was there were lower land prices after the hurricane, that's true. They were indifferent about architecture, the people who built these buildings. They did not have a choice, particularly. They came from Key West and other small cities, you know, southern cities like Atlanta and so on. They generally built smaller hotels, and they took the opportunity, they had the means and they had the motive. But Polly Redford would say later, a later builder, I don't care if it's Baroque or Brooklyn as long as it screams luxury. <laughs> So the source of the style doesn't come from the builders and developers, not really. They were open to it. They didn't, just like Carl Fisher, Carl Fisher wanted to do Mediterranean revival because that's what rich people wanted. So this was kind of their, this basically their idea as well. Now, one of the things about the Miami Herald in the 1930s, particularly on Saturdays, is they have a whole section about new real estate projects. And on April 30th, 1939, beneath the architect's pic, uh, rendering, rather, in this case, the caption reads, Swedish Modern Design. And I've read a number, I would say hundreds of these little verbs over the years, okay? and none of them say anything about the design other than it's modern. They have prefix, prefixes, Swedish Modern Design, Finnish Modern Design, Mediterranean modern design, but they always use the word modern. And what's really interesting about this is that the Chicago exhibition has already occurred in 1933 where they use the word modern to describe this interwar modern architecture. But here on Miami Beach, they use the word modern over and over and over again. As I said, they modify it, but they continue using the word modern. Now, there was also an ethnic succession going on in this, in this period. And again, these are from the, these notices in the Miami Herald. And this is uh, in 1938 and 19, uh, 1930 and 1939. And here, Novak and Eisenstein, Archie Greenberg, and Pruford, and this is Pruford and Wien. So there is a, a new group of people and remember, Miami Beach was notorious for not allowing people who were Jewish to buy them because of all the restrictive covenants, particularly north of, north of Lincoln Road. 
Now, Howard Kleinberg again says by the end of the 1930s, of the 28,000 people living on Miami Beach, all right, he says at least one quarter, which would be 7,000, were Jewish. Now, knowing in official records who is Jewish and who is not is even more complicated than the Jewish law about who is Jewish, okay? It's really hard to do. It. But there are ways to do it, and particularly using the last names as, as clues. And that's, Howard is relying on the University of Miami professor here who has done this for his life, he's counting that. So, how and why this design idea got to Miami Beach? We still haven't answered that question. Because what we've got are more questions. Did the hurricane of 1926 do it? That's, a lot of people would argue that. Did the architects do it? That's a pretty decent hypothesis. If you're talking about design, maybe the architects brought the design. Did the developers and the builders do it? Well, they did part of it. They built that enormous burst of boom, creating all of those buildings in a very short time. Did the New Deal do it? Oh, it brought in a new thing. Or did the New Dealers do it? So let's explore. And then, we need, we're trying to answer this question. How, in 1938, when unemployment surged once again, and 1930, in 1939, still higher than it had been for the two previous years, how was it that in Miami Beach, they were building buildings like this? As of August, 1935, Miami Beach is building at a rate of $107,892 a day. The city placed sixth among all of the cities in the country in the dollar value of permits for that final six months of that year. Now, I took a look and $107,000, or almost $108,000 in 1935 is equivalent in purchasing power in our year all right, of $1,991,542.44. Almost $2 million a day. Now obviously there would be days when it would be more or less, but this is, this, so this is an enormous boom, which I would argue we still haven't solved yet. How did this happen? Even more, this is the depression returned and so forth. So you actually had a loss in GDP in 1937 and in 38. Most people's idea of the Great Depression is formed in high school when they look at the wonderful photographs of Dorothea Lang and Walker Evans. This is what the depression means to people. Reasonably, because this, these are photographs, this is all these things happen. These are people. But at the same time, you have this building going up on Miami Beach. Doesn't appear in high school textbooks, by the way. Should, it doesn't, nor does this one. So, it's kind of a, a question, you know, maybe philosophical, but also historical. You know, what's necessary to have something happen, and then what's sufficient? Is there anything here that could explain it by itself? Is there anything we could leave out and still have an explanation? So let's take a look. The hurricane. This is Ocean Drive after the hurricane. This is 1927. Excuse me. Yeah, this is 1927 and 1929. The argument against the hurricane being a factor is that right after the hurricane, people built these two very large structures, which are still among the largest structures in the, in the Miami Beach Architectural District, tallest structures. So the hurricane is not a sufficient you know, explanation for the whole thing. Are the architects. Problem, Hohauser, when he is a Pratt Institute, studied histor historicism. That is to say, he studied things like the Woolworth building. France and Annis at Armour Institute of Technology studied Beaux-Arts design and architecture, which brought to the design that they're doing symmetricality and a desire to link in some way or another with the environment surrounding. So, Schultz, Schultz and Weaver was a firm 
responsible for both these buildings. This is, of course, the Freedom Tower downtown in Miami, and this is the Waldorf Astoria, and L. Murray Dixon worked for Schultz and Weaver, not on this project, but he did work with them on this. So it's quite possible that he learned about what everybody was calling modern design and architecture when he was with Schultz and Weaver. Did the New Deal do it? Well, you remember our guy, Archie Greenberg, a merchant of Worcester, Massachusetts. Now, what is a merchant from Worcester, Massachusetts doing financing the construction of a building on South Beach? First off, this is, you know, this was actually, if I remember correctly, 1939. Where did he get the capital? You had the NRA, the National Recovery Administration, which was forcing and encouraging consolidations and buying out smaller proprietors, people like Archie Greenberg, the merchant from Worcester, Massachusetts. And again, in these Miami Herald articles, over and over again, names like this appear with occupations like this, a poultry market, a haberdashery, etc. Small business people coming here who are financing these buildings. The cultural front, part of the New Deal. December 8th, 1933, people were so excited. What were they excited about? They were excited because the New Deal, through the Works Progress Administration and successor organization, was basically paying artists all over the country. Within eight days, the first artists had their checks. Within three weeks, they all. If you really want to get something done, it can be done. So people were so excited. Why were they excited? Well, of course, Eleanor Roosevelt was involved. This may have nothing to do with anything here, but it's very interesting. Somebody, Egmont Ahrens, sent a telegram to Franklin Delano Roosevelt, which Franklin Delano Roosevelt may have seen and may not, offering to bring his slideshow to show the president. And the topic of the slideshow was going to be streamline for recovery. Trains as well as streamlined trees, flowers, whales, driving girls, refrigerators, houses, gadgets, women's fashion, stock, etc. He was going to make streamlining the theme of all of the recovery for the New Deal. As I say, there's absolutely no evidence that Franklin Delano Roosevelt ever saw this telegram. There's no evidence that he ever did anything about it. And to me, the idea that Franklin Roosevelt would sit still for a slideshow is just not very persuasive. But it does, what this does show is this is what people were thinking. That the New Deal was an opportunity to bring new artistic thought to the whole country. And they did. <laughs> Including these art and arco buildings from Phoenix, Arizona, from Richmond, California. This is LaGuardia Airport in New York. And I'm blanking for this one, and it's on, it's on below here on the white. It's like I can't see it. Salmon City. Pardon me? Salmon City. City, Idaho. Right, thank you. Hmm. So, on uh, Miami Beach, the WPA does both Mediterranean Revival and also Art Deco. Now, the WPA actually doesn't do this building, it's the Treasury Department that does this, but it's the WPA, I mean, it's a New Deal building. So, the final thing is the Wagner Act was passed in 1935, and one of the key provisions of the Wagner Act was protecting the rights of people to collective bargaining. Unlike just about every other industrial nation, industrialized nation that had gone through this process from 1870 to 1920, had required employers to provide a paid vacation for their industrial workers. The United States didn't do it, and they still haven't done it. But the point is that it permitted the workers to organize for themselves. And the basic fact of the matter is that by 1940, Vacation coverage for hourly employees had grown to 50%. And some of them could use that paid vacation for a winter vacation, guess where? 30 hours away by train on Miami Beach. And Holly Redford describes these folks 
as a class of people newly rich in a way industrial workers who could afford a vacation. A way that had not been possible until mass market machinery made luxuries commonplace. This was, after all, the meaning of industrial democracy. So, Mediterranean revival was used to attract rich people. The Art Deco style played to the new desire of the New Dealers to be modern. Entre these entrepreneurs had opportunity, means, and motive. And by the way, these were certainly risk-aware people. Some, you might even argue, some of them might have been risk-oblivious. I think Archie Greenberg probably was. Mm -hmm. But they certainly were not risk-adverse. And one of my major complaints <laughs> about this current situation in the city of Miami Beach is that we have too many risk-adverse developers. They won't put their money out until they have changed the rules of government to maximize or to minimize their risk. You can't build, you can't do something that's original if that's your purpose. In any event, tourists with the desire and willingness willing to pay, and architects and designers who supply the work demand of the working class for this. So, Miami Beach, excuse me, Miami Beach back in 1927, we saw that already. And then this is Miami Beach in 1937. This is Ocean Drive. The area here is going to be developed in 38, 39. This is where the, the Bancroft is, where the San Moritz is, and so forth and so on. Okay. These are all single family homes in here. There are trees all around. But this is, this is what has happened by 1937. This is the result of that boom that we just talked about. So a surging wave rising from economic depression, modernity in design, ethnic succession, business opportunity, and New Deal influence landed on the shores of Miami Beach and created the Art Deco District. That's my argument. You can believe it or not. <laughs> Are there any questions? Any questions? We're almost out. We actually are out of time. Yes. Yes. So, so Jeff, Jeff, does that translate into sort of like what you were saying the rich people, the consumer wanted it? You sort of, when you said the surging wave, yeah. you the consumer then. Yeah, the consumers, I think, I, I think, if, you know, I think we can't, we can't show this with the same certainty that we get when we get, you know, how did uh, Alden Freeman get the idea? It's not that certainty. But I think the fact that these new people were doing this and they were here, and they were the customers that people wanted and that they could get. Um, they, they drove it, it seems to me. That, that's, that is, in fact, my argument, that that's what happened. Now, all of those other things are also part of it. The NRA is part of it and so forth, and, and the spread of the cultural front throughout the United States is also part of all of those things are part of it. But why it happens here is really dependent on that new group of people, as Polly Redford people said, newly rich in a way the world had never seen before. Any other questions? Yes? Both the lecture. Um, did marketing also play a Absolutely, role? absolutely. But the question is, what were they marketing? They were marketing what was up to date. Uh, back in the late 80s, when I first started giving the tours in 88, there were still people who would come who had been here in the 1930s. They were older people kind of my age now. In any event, all right, they, and I said, what's it like? And they said, you know, we would come in and we would ask to be taken to the latest hotel. We wanted things to be up to date. And more than one person, in, not in, in multiple groups, said that. Because any time I heard that somebody had been here, I always asked that question. And that's what they said. They wanted to be, they wanted to be where the latest was. Which is different, of course, from Alden Freeman, who wanted to have people think that he was living in 1512. <laughs> different, big difference in, in, in cultural taste and in desire. Any other questions? All right, thank you very much. Thank you.